I lived out near Colton, Oregon, or, or a farm or ranch about five miles out of town. It was in the fall about ten years ago. My Doberman was making some racket just about dark, and my son and I went out to see what it was. As the raunchy smell hit me, I noticed on top of the hill behind the house a Bigfoot, just standing there, not more than seventy, five yards away. Not particularly scared as the thing was up the hill. My first reaction was to shout at it, and it went lumbering away, awkward, like its knees never straightened but it still took large strides. The doby dog headed for the house with its little doby tail, trying to get between his legs. It was a big, stocky male, I said, five hundred and maybe seven feet tall. All he did was just stand there looking at us. The only noise may be a grunting sound. A few days later at my mother-in-law's place on the edge of Colton, there were Bigfoot tracks in the new snow across the creek from their trailer home. They were of three individuals, a larger, a medium, and a small set. Measurements weren't taken. First off, I would like to keep my name confidential, just for the fact that this happened on an Air Force base and I don't know who reads this stuff. This happened sometime in September of 99. I forget the exact date. It was early in the month, though. It was between 2 and 3 a.m. I was a security forces airman, working third shift on base patrol. Now, mind you, this is an Air National Guard base that I worked at full-time. It's on the north side of Duluth, Minnesota, next to the International Airport. North to northeast is nothing but large wooded areas, forest areas. Third shift on the base was pretty boring. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and us full-timers worked a skeleton crew, usually only five, six of us, on third shift. I was in the patrol truck, doing my usual rounds, checking doors and fence lines. Late at night on the north side of the base was usually creepy enough when patrolling by yourself. Anyways, I was on this road driving towards our baseball field when my headlights caught a pair of eyes reflecting back at me. They were almost eye-level with me, and I was sitting in an F-150. Around this time, a few of the guys had been seeing this huge buck around the property, like a 16-pointer or something around that size. I was about 80 yards or so when I saw these eyes reflecting back at me. So I'm thinking it was a big deer. I gotta see this thing. So I hit the gas and started speeding towards the field. This is where it all happened so fast. It's almost hard to explain. There was a little slope behind the baseball field. It sloped down probably about 12, 15 feet into a brush line. The brush went about 30 feet, then turned into a thick tree line. The brush was probably armpit high to me and pretty tough to traverse through, being so thick. As I turned into the baseball field and turned the truck towards the thing, I'd just caught the rear end of the thing leaping down the slope, below the line of sight of my headlights. The thing was no more than about twenty feet. Ahead of me, when it leaped, all I got a look at was the back end of the thing, and it was big. The best I can do to describe it is to say that it was wolf or dog-like in nature. It had a long tail, longer than two feet. The hind legs looked exactly like that of a dog's. Same with the back paws, but the paws were huge. They were bigger than my hands, for sure. The hair or fur was wavy, yet matted and thick. The color was blondish or very light brown. I didn't notice any gray in it, but this all happened within about two, three seconds. I sat in my patrol truck for a couple of seconds, confused and thinking, I know what I saw, but it couldn't have been what I saw. So I hopped out with my flashlight and M16 rifle and walked to the edge of the slope. All I heard was the thing running through the woods in front of me, heading in a northwest direction. And this thing sounded like a moose charging through the trees. It made a lot of noise. That's when I started to get really scared, thinking if this is some sort of wolf or whatever it could be, 
my men 16 isn't going to do a thing to this animal. So I jumped back into my patrol truck as fast as I could and headed back to the SF headquarters. I never told any of the other members about this for fear of ridicule or being called crazy. There is no way I misidentified this thing. I'm a trained observer, an avid hunter, and have worked with animal rehabilitation with the Minnesota DNR in the past. I know my animals in the North Woods extremely well. I saw exactly what I saw, and that was the back end of a large wolf or dog thing that basically had its eyes level with mine while I was in a patrol truck. The back end was definitely much larger than any of the largest deer or black bears I've seen. The points I remember the clearest were the tail and back paws, as well as the texture and color of the hair or fur. This is my story. I have never told it to anyone in fear or ridicule. I swear it to be the truth. I am an anthropology graduate of Humboldt State University, where I studied primatology under Rosalind Ribnick. Her training about Bigfoot during the course enabled me to understand and deal with our strange encounter. It was my sister, a veterinarian, my girlfriend, and I who were traveling and camping throughout Oregon when we pulled over to sleep for the night. Moments after laying out our bags, we were screamed at from the springs, not more than 50 yards away. This was a typical Sasquatch warning to others, as well as a threat to us for being in its territory. The stomping, obvious bipedal crunching in the brush and shrieking lasted about 20 minutes. I told my team to lay still. We were actually frozen with adrenalized fear and couldn't move. We could not make out any shapes. It was hiding and wouldn't come any closer. But I was positive it was a rogue male Sasquatch we had startled from upstream. The sound was so blood-curdling and loud it hurt our eardrums and gave us mountain-sized goosebumps. Feel free to contact me further if you'd like. I have been involved in Sasquatch research for years. story about my dad, who is a hunter but was not hunting at the time. We were all hiking, but dad wanted our car to be at the end of the trail so we didn't have to hike two times as much. So he drove a short while up while we got started. He knew the trail better than us, which is easy when none of us have ever been on this trail. He could catch up, though. That is, if we were on the same trail. There was a fork that the rest of us got to, and the only instruction was to stay on the same path. However, this was a very tight J.E., and logic dictated either of them could be the same path. So we elected left. That was our first mistake. However, we found campers so, when it rained, we had a safe spot. We thought Dad had gone missing, so we were trying to send him messages, so when he got to the rare spot with service, we could meet up. Dad cleared the entire trail like three times that day looking for us, and cell service was going to be non-existent on the trail with the rain going on, so make that two mistakes on us. During the night, as he was desperately looking for us, thinking we had gotten lost, he heard a loud crash right behind him. He looked, and about a foot behind him, a large tree had fallen. He was that close to being killed. Needless to say, we were coached on trail safety afterward. If you do not know where you're going, go back or wait for help if you can't find your way back. Not a hunter, but I live in the deep south, and when I was a kid, my family owned a big stretch of property in the woods. We still do, technically speaking, but I don't live close to there. My favorite place to play was out in the middle of the trees where I could pretend to be a fantasy adventure character or hunt fairies or whatever. I was little and really into that. However, at some point I started to discover abandoned hunting camps and stands. Not abandoned in the sense that no one had used them in a while. 
not unusual in the off-seasons, but abandoned as in half-eaten cans left to dust and rot, sleeping bags left there just to ruin in the rain, and things in general left, in a state that suggested they left in a hurry. At one point, I found an abandoned stuffed animal and a pillow that were literally moldy. Logic says maybe the owners are just super irresponsible, but when I was like seven, it gave me a really bad vibe, and I didn't go that far out again. Then later as an adult, I saw a boar, and I was like, hmm, perhaps not. I've seen old Yeller low. I wasn't there, but my son, son-in-law, and their friends saw a dog man. My son called me all freaked out, thinking they had encountered a Bigfoot because he knew I believed in Bigfoots. Now my son had always made fun of me for believing in Bigfoots. He asked me, Dad, can Bigfoots run on all fours? I said yes, and he asked why. He replied, Dad, we just saw one out spotlighting rabbits. I asked him to describe what it looked like, and he said they were hunting rabbits with a spotlight. He saw something hunched over, thinking it was a large bird because it was down like it was eating something. Then it stood up on its hind legs, spread its arms out wide. When the others came to look, it dropped down and took off faster than anything they had ever seen before. He described it having a dog snout covered in fur, but visibly muscular. My son, who is six feet tall, felt it stood as tall or taller than him. When it took off, they ran after it, watching it jump and clear a huge rock pile in one leap. This scared them, and they all ran back to their car to get out of there. I spoke to all three, and they had the same story, describing it in the same way. I told my son that it's not a Bigfoot because Bigfoots don't have dog snouts. He saw a dog man. It's funny that this happened around a lot of cornfields, and the area also had caves, and was covered in sagebrush. While bow hunting on Mount Emily in late August of 1982, I must admit I'm not sure of the exact year, but it was 1980. One 1983... My wife and I drove up to the summit from exit 243 on I-84. We were camped closer to the main highway. When we arrived at the top, I noticed what I thought was another hunter sitting by a tree. As we drove past, I turned to look again, and this creature stood up and walked across the road to the hillside and started to go down. When it stopped and looked at us, I realized it was not a hunter and was much too large. It vanished over the hillside. I got out of my pickup and went to that spot to look. It had been standing next to a tree and appeared to be the same height, approximately eight feet. The fact that it stood up and walked several feet before it disappeared convinced me it was not a bear, besides the fact that there are no bears in Oregon that tall. So for context, I'm a hospital security officer. We have a decent amount of grounds around our community hospital consisting of woods and old golfing grounds as this whole property used to be a good course, which we patrol in a Polaris as it is now a walking trail. We often take posts on the trail in certain spots to catch those doing what they shouldn't be. For reference, I live in south-central Ishpa, and the northwest side of our property has always kind of given me a weird vibe. I pulled off into a new spot. It's an odd little path that leads into the woods. I backed in. I turned off the vehicle and immediately started to feel paranoid. I told myself I was fine, and it was all in my head. But I kept feeling the need to check my mirrors and look around. I sat there for about 15 minutes, if even. I had the driver's window down for fresh air until I heard this noise, as if it was heavy breathing coming right below my window. I froze for a moment, but immediately cranked the window up and drove off. I had tears in my eyes. There were no animals, nothing big enough to sound like that. I haven't been out to do my rounds on the trail since this. 
It was one thing when the trail of Miss N gave me bad vibes, but to have experienced this has made it more uncomfortable. I did not go far. I looked back in nothing, checked my mirrors and surrounding as I pulled away. I turned around and immediately looking around where I was. I saw nothing. I've had paranormal and unexplained experiences since I was a small child, so this is not new to me as far as that. But the heavy breathing I can still hear if I think about it, and it still has me uncomfortable. I've lived near the woods for most of my life. Some woods felt weird, others felt fine. But I hate being out at night in the house we live in now. The woods just ooze this creepy feeling and I don't know how to describe it. It's fine during the day, but at night it's weird. It's not like something's watching you or anything like that, but it's just frightening to stand near or even outside during the night. One time, I heard tapping coming from all around the house. Not at once, but like something was walking around the exterior of the house. Tap, 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 tapping. Another time, I heard screams coming from the woods. They couldn't have been human screams. They were too consistent and came at regular intervals every ten seconds or so. I thought it might be mountain lions, but they don't live in our area. I considered foxes, but they don't get that loud. I still don't know what it was, and I still get that overwhelming feeling when I walk near those woods at night to walk my dog, even though nothing has ever happened. It just freaks me out. I'd never been a big fan of camping. Circa 2012, for some reason or another, my friend and I decided to spend a Saturday night camping on private property. We had permission from the owner, on the bank of a small lake in rural America's southeast. The lake wasn't very large, probably only 50, 150 yards across. I'm not great at estimating distance. It was more of a deep pond, but it was five times as long as it was wide, and from the perspective of our camp, it consumed the majority of our sight line. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five, ten miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized southern city. It wasn't easy to access, and the only way in was a gated, narrow dirt road across a levee spanning one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us his code, and we pulled the car through, locking the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of cities. Our cities are small, and the rural areas often have people living rough and wild. We have dense woods, so thick that building isn't worth it unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through a lot of it when they were building highways in the 50s, so not much development has happened in the last hundred years and in some places since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30-minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see stars and hear the sounds of nature. We were at our very utilitarian camp, small Coleman too, person tent and a blanket, simply looking around and enjoying the night when suddenly my buddy sat up real straight. He said something like, Do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, Nah, it's just the dark playing tricks on you. He seemed actually shaken. No, look. There's a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention, and I sat up fully, rubbing my eyes to try to gain full focus. And then I saw them. Small, round, white faces stared back at me from across the lake. Maybe fifteen, twenty of them. All were positioned in such a way that their bodies were behind the trees, and only their heads were visible. The best way I can describe the faces is like very pale, somehow internally illuminated children. I should mention that neither of us was drinking or high. We were too young for that, not for at least a few more years. 
We had eaten dinner at home and were just planning on going to sleep after chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I sat there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or owls or something. But I would never come to that realization. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back at my friend, and then they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard extensive shuffling from the other side of the lake and a couple of small branches snap. It's incredible what your ears pick up on during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up a little when he said, What the hell were those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well. I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping. But what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the Internet, but never found a phenomenon that could explain that. So this happened about seven years ago. I was around 1920 and I was a scout leader. We had a camp in a forest. The nearest city was about 10, 15 minutes drive. Every year in the end July, we would have an international scout camp. Scouts from different European countries would join us. I was in the preparations team and we would go around two, three week in advance to clean and put the tents up. In the preparation team, we had around 20 people, 10, 12 men, and the rest women. We were all in our late teens or early 20s. If anyone has been a scout might know that the first thing in a camp is setting up a flag. The flag is important part if this camping game. Other scouts would constantly try to steal the flag. If they managed to steal, then the lost team would have to go home. This never actually happened. No one was ever sent home. It was just a rule to keep other members involved and willing to protect the flag. Therefore, we had to constantly keep an eye or a guard, team member, near the flag. Other games involved attacking other teams and kidnapping members. All fun and games, nothing violent or harsh. It was fun and made us be alert 24-7. So here is where my creepy story begins. One night, our preparation team was done with everything. The other two countries from Europe, about 60 people, were set to arrive in the morning. We had nothing to do, so we set up a campfire and started singing and talking. We had our guards, people from the team, set up in different locations, two near the flag, two near the entrance, and two in the woods facing the river. So we were tired and decided to go sleep. We would change guards every two hours. Each guard had a whistle. If an animal or a person was to come to the camp, they would blow a certain note of a whistle as to alarm danger. That night, I was an hour into sleep when I heard a whistle. We all woke up and ran to the team member who had whistled. She claimed she saw three white figures running fast in the forest near the set-up tents. We thought that the morning teams arrived early and sneaked in to steal the flag or kidnap a member. So we all decided to stay awake and go into defense mode. We each stood guard in different locations, watching for any signs. After some time, we started hearing whistles from the deeper parts of the forest. We also started hearing radio sounds from different places. We saw some guys in white shirts running around in the forest. Me and two other people decided to check the empty tents to see if there were people hiding in the empty tents, but couldn't find anyone. Then we started walking around, and we heard loud laughter from a bush near us. It sounded like a woman laughing, so we started laughing too as we thought we found the other scout team near the bush. Naturally, we walked to the bush without any hesitation. To our horror, there was no one. Then we heard more noises from another bush that was a little bit deeper in the woods. Then we heard a clear conversation between a few people speaking French in an accent. We could hear them clearly, so we checked that again. Nothing. Then we saw a guy in white t-shirt running fast again in front of us. But his speed was weird. He was running so fast as if he was sliding. Keep in mind we were in woods at night with no lights. There's no way someone can run without making a noise. But somehow this guy was running so quiet. It really seemed like he was just sliding. 
again, we still didn't feel threatened. We just had adrenaline rush, but it was more excitement to catch them than anything else. After all, we just wanted the fun to begin. We were excited to see the teams again and have fun. For the next two or so hours, we kept hearing whistles and whispers in French, but we couldn't find a single person. It was so clear there, there were a lot of people hiding around us, but we couldn't catch even one of them. They were fast and so sneaky. This is important to mention that the arriving teams were not from France, so it was weird to hear them speak in French. Anyways, after two hours of running in the forest in the dark, I got tired. I didn't take this too seriously, so myself and a couple of my friends went back into our tent to rest. I laid down and after ten minutes saw a car light speeding towards us. This area is not designed for regular cars to arrive. None of us or other teams had cars. A bus from the near city would drop us there and pick us up after the camp was over. We heard a car coming straight towards our tents with high beams on. It was coming so fast that we were frozen, expecting it to hit us any moment. It happened so fast that we couldn't even run. Then suddenly it just stopped right near our tent. We heard the door open, but heard no footsteps. Whoever it was just closed the door and left. We were shaking, and at that moment it hit me that it couldn't have been anyone from the other teams. We got out and learned that our other teammates also had seen a jeep speeding towards our tent, but didn't see anyone coming out of the car. After this, we just decided to stay awake till morning. Throughout the entire night, we kept seeing these white-shirted men sliding around us. We couldn't see any faces. They were fast and weird. We could hear loud laughters and French whispers all around our camp. We could tell there were a lot of strangers near the camp who were either messing around with us or had plans to hurt us. The sun came up and the strange thing stopped. We didn't manage to catch anyone or figure out who they were. In the morning, the other teams arrived. We had this leaderboard meetings every afternoon where we would discuss daily plans and meals. Also, we would share about any planned or failed attacks. All the team leaders said they arrived in the morning, so they were not even in the country at night. Up to this day, I have no idea who those people were. I have no idea what they wanted or what their plans were. They never attacked or kidnapped anyone in the team. It was scary when I think of it. What would happen if we didn't have guards that night? What would happen if we were all asleep? At the end of the day, this was a campsite in a wooded area, and woods can be places where cults and crazy people gather. I was camping with my kids when I woke up to the sound of blood-curdling screaming. It was my own kids screaming. They were pointing at the tent door. The zipper was unzipping, and a tiny hand came in and was trying to pull my backpack out. I forgot there were raisins in it, raccoons. My kids were terrified of raccoons before this happened, so their screaming was intense. They calmed down after a couple minutes, and I expected to hear someone shout everything okay over there, or for a park ranger to walk up because there were lots of campers and sites nearby, and my kids were screaming bloody murder, like straight from a horror movie, but no one checked on us. I imagine maybe they were all laying there too scared to move in case they were the next ones to be murdered, and that maybe they are still wondering about the screaming ghost or unreported murder to this day. I've never told this story before, not even to my two best friends or my closest family members. This experience happened in the early summer of 2002 in the Mississippi River Valley in the state of Illinois. I was a government employee at the time, so I'll keep the place and specifics vague for the sake of people that have to live around these things. I was two months into the job, fully enjoying being the new guy in a new part of the part of the country that I've never seen before. On that day, my job was to do a biological survey on a dry riverbed. It was a boat ramp used to access the area when water was present. 
I parked my government work truck with the nose towards the riverbed and the boat ramp to my left. I got out of the truck, took several steps ahead to look over the area, and made a plan on how to start my survey. After about a minute, I suddenly was hit with a sense of immediate danger. It was tangible, and it was physical. I could feel the sensation smack into my left shoulder and slide across the skin of my chest from left to right, like being shot with a jet of water from a fire hose. The danger felt like it was coming from knee level or lower, and I backpedaled in an unexplained sudden panic. I kept my knees bent and my arms forward because I was sure I was being charged by a vicious stray dog that I'd never seen or heard. Once safely back in the truck cab, I looked all around for the dog that I was sure had to be there, and I saw nothing. After about three minutes of confusion and adrenaline burn-off, I had no explanation for what had just happened. I laughed to myself for being silly, and I tell myself I have a job to do, so get out and go do it. I get out for a second time, and I step forward to my original standing spot to decide how I'm going to start the survey. I again get hit with this fire hose of danger from my toes to the top of my head. I do the same, running fast, backpedaling, and getting back into the truck cab. Both times the feeling disappeared the instant the truck door slammed shut. I'm really spooked. My hands are trembling on the steering wheel while I'm asking myself if I'm having a heart attack or an allergic reaction. I sit there for seven or eight minutes trying to recompose myself. I punch the dash in frustration and tell myself to get my butt out there and do my job. I was the new guy and did not want to be seen as unreliable. I get out of the truck a third time and step forward to my original standing spot. Now everything that follows is happening in a split, second sequence, and it'll take longer to explain than it did to experience. The moment my foot stepped onto my original standing spot, I got hit with a 100% blast of the fire hose of danger feeling. I mean, absolute primitive fear and danger like standing on a high-tension bridge that is collapsing with you on it, or standing in front of an avalanche of snow in the last four seconds before it hits you. My legs were running before my mind knew I was running as I spun around and ran for the truck cab. I was saying in a panic to myself in that internal voice, Cuss, get in the damn truck! By my second or third step, I see something in my peripheral vision. To my right... It was just past three, and about twenty feet away, there was an unnatural brown color like a Crayola crayon. It was a pear-shaped blob, five half feet tall, in the shape and size of a squatting heavyweight sumo wrestler. All I saw was a brown blob, but it clearly stood out from the surrounding nature. I could feel a presence as strong and powerful as a short-tempered rodeo bull. In a split second, I grab the door handle. I clearly hear it say in the same voice, Leave, leave now. Leave this place. It was stern, commanding, and calm, with none of the panic that was flooding through my mind. I calmed down enough to safely drive home and call it a day. During our stay, two men approached to inquire about renting the Music Ranger station. The topic of Bigfoot naturally came up, and one of the gentlemen, a local historian, shared a captivating tale. He recounted a story from a friend of his who, during the fall of the early 1980s, was on a hunting expedition along the main through road. His friend, positioned near his truck, suddenly witnessed a creature identified as Bigfoot crossing the road, not more than 100 yards away. The creature was moving downhill, descending from the mountain. The encounter must have been nothing short of astonishing, and the tale left us with a lingering sense of wonder and intrigue about the mysteries that might unfold in the vast wilderness. It was the summer of 2000, and I was just a non rate stationed on a 110 Coast Guard gutter out of Key West, Florida. We had enjoyed three days of calm weather and the seas were glassy smooth, 
Rare nights like this are when smugglers like to make a run, and we were sitting on a darkened ship on a known drug route, an awesome fishing spot due to a massive drop off underneath us. We had our radar set to max, our ears wide open and our mouths clamped shut. Sound carries like crazy out there, and sometimes you can hear the engines of a go, fast screaming before radar even picks them up. But tonight was dead. No activity at all. I was coming onto the bridge for the 3.30 watch shift. Our J.O.D. was checking the equipment for a pass. Down, but when he got to the radar, he gave a little W.T.T. up under his breath. The oncoming O.O.D. came over to see what was up said the same thing, then called our CO on the sound-powered phone. We heard him say, Hey, Cap, we have two contacts moving fast coming straight at us about 40 knots out. So we think we're about to see some action, and everyone starts getting amped up when we hear him give the speed. 400 knots and holding steady. At this point, we think it's just a radar anomaly or some running rabbit's radar. TP call. But these two staggered contacts stayed on the scope, and their signal just got stronger. Whatever it was was about the size of a cargo ship moving about 450 miles per hour and wasn't even leaving a wake. You can see a wake on the radar, especially on a calm night. After hearing this, the CLU is on deck in his bathrobe about 30 seconds later just staring at the radar, and everyone is just perplexed trying to get a look in over his shoulder. So he sends us all out onto the bridge wing with night vision goggles and has us all looking out for these things. Every few seconds he is counting down the range, and right when they get to eight miles out, they simply drop off the radar. Boom, just gone. Now both of us non-rates get sent down to the bow of the ship and told to listen for anything. See if we can hear anything or see anything or whatever. So we listen, and it's so quiet that all we can hear is the blood pounding in our ears. Then after not even a minute of vigilance, we see something. Two lights underwater moving fast, coming directly at us. If we had blinked, we would have missed them. In just a moment, they had passed directly under our bow and were gone. The best description I can give would be like two train lights moving slightly staggered, not too deep under crystal clear water. Maybe 40 or 50 feet down, the leading vessel was slightly silhouetted by the trailing vessel, and the brief impression I got of it was like the engine car of a train, just way larger. It was over so fast I really never got a look, so I can't say much more than that about them. My fellow lookout and I exchanged a shocked look at each other, and he asked me if I had just seen it too. We talked excitedly about it for a second and ran back up to report our findings. After we made it to the bridge and started telling the CU guy what we had seen, the quartermaster shut us up saying they had popped back up on radar. Sure enough, eight miles out, there they were, still moving staggered at 400 knots. We watched them disappear off the radar at about 40 plus miles in silence. All of us just held our positions until they passed out of range. Then the old man asked us what we saw. We told him, and after a minute of silence, he just said, Weird. Radar glitch it is. Then sighed and went back to bed. After he wished us a good watch and went below deck the COB, most senior chief of the boat pulled us up to the flying bridge for a talk. He basically told us that there are lots of weird things out here, and that this was not the first time he had heard about underwater oddities from sailors, but was the first he had ever been a part of. He didn't say we shouldn't tell anyone, but he made it pretty clear most people wouldn't believe us if we did. That was it. The next night was just as calm, and we ended up stopping a drug smuggler with nearly a ton of product on board, and we all just sort of put the incident behind us and moved on with our normal lives. All I can say after two decades of experience in the military is that in the middle of the ocean, on a clear night and with a good set of NBG, you can see little zippy things in the sky, just about every night, if you have some patience. In my years of sea time, I've seen lots of odd things, but that night will always stand out in my memories.
This is a very difficult story for me to talk about. I've kept it hidden since June 1988. At the time, I was living in Canoga Park, California. It was a two-week-long event that started out with me waking up around 1 a.m. to go into my kitchen and stare out the window at a certain spot in the sky. I would see a light, but was unsure if it was a star or something else. I knew what I was doing there at the window, but would not consciously admit it to myself. It's difficult to explain, almost as though I knew what was coming and what I was looking for. This two-week event is too long and too involved to type the whole thing out here. Still, it involved abduction, my physically seeing the ship, physically seeing two entities in my apartment twice, and also a hooded figure that appeared at the foot of my bed and did something to the bottom of my foot that was very painful. During this two-week time, I contacted Yvonne Smith, and she and Bud Hopkins worked with me to help me through these two weeks. I also called Yvonne in a panic the second time. The entities were in my apartment. Also, the morning after the abduction, I woke up with a bruise the size of a huge dinner plate on my stomach. Don't know if this makes sense. But after the abduction, I was returned to my bed, and I immediately knew something had happened to me. It's just too hard to explain the details here. I began having dreams about what was done to me during the abduction, and also about the things they showed me. Bud Hopkins wanted to make this more public. Get it out there, but I refused. I was too afraid, and I've been too afraid all these years to talk about those two weeks. I'm almost 70 years old now, and I want to finally make what happened to me known. It's time. Also, I believe there was a connection to Rocket Dine, which was just a few blocks from my apartment. If I can talk with someone, I can tell them why I think that. Yvonne wanted to use hypnosis on me to get more details, but I was too afraid to know more. I think I was afraid they would come back. Please, I just want to get this story out. Maybe telling it will help me in some way and possibly help someone else. I've lived with this a long, long time, and it changed how I see the world and my life. It changed me as a person. A friend and I were followed and eventually taunted by what looked like an alien for hours one night in 2012. The things that took place that night were the scariest things I've ever seen. Not even in fiction have I heard or seen anything like it. A short version. I was just bored one night with a friend and decided to walk home at dark from a local gas station a little over a mile. I live in Louisiana, so it's acres of woods on either side of the road. Despite trying to explain away the sound of breaking branches as if something was following us, the sound of something walking next to us lasted all the way until the first light pole near the neighborhood. Now feeling brave with the light pole and the first house in sight, I yelled taunts at where the sound was coming from. We stared at a moving bush and a head popped up and just stared at us. We both see it and later draw the same exact thing so we weren't imagining it. We ran until we ran out of breath and were followed by red lights, like small red laser dots from the distance, in pairs like eyes. From the distance, anywhere we looked, and they appeared anywhere we focused on for too long. Finally, at my friend's home, all three of his dogs are hiding whimpering under his truck, lying side by side. They're usually hyper as hell, and we couldn't even drag them out because they would run right back under. As soon as we walk into the house and close the door, small pebbles start hitting every side of the house at once. A back window breaks from one, and there's a pair of tiny red lights in the distance, everywhere you look outside. It slows down, and we gain enough courage to walk outside and yell at it. We walked down the steps and started yelling insults. We were stupid. Suddenly, out of complete silence, behind the neighbor's house... A pair of white, shiny eyes, like a wolf, but not attached to any form, slowly approached us. It started slowly, and by the 200-foot mark, it started sprinting towards us and separating into an additional two pairs of eyes as it's charging. We ran inside and locked the door behind us. Seconds later, it threw itself at the door, or at least that's what it sounded like. 
We looked toward the front door, which the center is stained glass, and you could clearly see a silhouette of a four-foot large headed being inches from the front door, just standing there looking at us. We turn away for a second, look back, and it's gone. Then the rocks start being thrown again. While pebbles are being thrown, hitting every side of the house, we look out the front window. We're standing in the center of the living room, next to each other with a kitchen knife, both crying at this point. Outside across the street is an abandoned house covered in moss and stuff. Its kitchen light turns on. You can see the plants and stuff inside. It's just a table in there. There was no electricity running to that house, but the light was on. The light goes out. I honestly don't remember much of the rest of the night from this point. The last I remember is we were sitting in the center of the living room, both with a kitchen knife back to back, sitting on a bed cover, crying as pebbles kept hitting the sides of the house. In the morning, we drove past where we saw the alien pop its head out of the bush in three state police cars and a regular looking truck were parked at the bush in the woods, as if they were searching in the woods. Looking back, I wonder why the hell did not try to record any of this, but I remember back then I just had one of those black and white text with numbers type of cell phones. God, I wish I had the tech I do now. I would almost say I'd experience it again just to be able to record it. But I only say that because I was with someone during it. I imagine if I was alone, I'd pass the hell out or something. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that it's likely this was just a mountain lion. Either way, it's one of the scariest things that has happened to me in the woods. In early March of 2021, I was just barely recovering from a significant concussion enough to where I could drive again. I still couldn't work for another few weeks and couldn't look at screens or even read, so I was spending plenty of my time just going on short walks and such to pass the time in ways that didn't aggravate my head. I want a small trailhead I hadn't been to before. If it weren't for the trees, I think houses about half a mile away or less would have been visible from the parking lot, so I wasn't exactly deep in the wilderness. I had a weird feeling I shouldn't go. I was alone, but as always, I was armed with my kitu and figured I was just being goofy because it was a dreary, cloudy day with some chill and a slight breeze. I approached the trailhead, feeling very strange, like I really shouldn't be there. I saw a single car in the parking area and figured that maybe since a previous car of mine had been broken into a trailhead a few years previous, I was worried it would happen again with my car now being the only other one up there. I backed in and hung out for a few minutes. Two dudes with fishing poles came from the left where I couldn't see but could clearly hear a rushing river. They got in their car and left, and my I shouldn't be here since persisted. Being an idiot, I still got out and headed up the trail. I had no idea how long it was or where it went, but I didn't really intend on going the full way. Unless it was short, I just wanted to walk for a while outdoors. The trees hadn't gotten their leaves back, and it was a dreary day, as I mentioned earlier. But that usually doesn't put me on edge. As I walked, the strong feeling to turn back got more and more obvious. I felt myself glancing all over literally constantly. It wasn't even fun anymore to be up there. It's only been a couple minutes, too. I mean, the feeling of dread was so immediately strong, I could still see my car in the parking lot when I finally decided it was time to go because it has gotten that strong so quickly. I turned around, hand on my pistol in its holster, and stopped to listen. A few seconds after I turned around, I heard a big footstep off to my right. It was a big snap of a branch that had been on the ground already, maybe 25, 30 yards away. I'm not sure if it matters that the branch was already on the ground. Other than that, I know it wasn't deadfall. I've been working in audio for way too long and can tell a lot about an event simply by how it sounds. That might sound silly, but it's important to know that I could 100% tell. It was a footstep that had, likely accidentally, stepped on a branch that was already present on the forest floor. I waited a second or two after this big snap to head out, 
I looked over the place it had come from, able to see what felt like a decent amount because of the lack of leaves on the trees, but I couldn't see anything that looked alive. Not wanting to trigger a pursuit instinct and whatever it was, I started walking down the trail. I had my sidearm in hand drawn at that point. My car wasn't far, and I'm on naturally fast walk, so this seems like the best course of action. I got back to my car in a minute or two and heard nothing at all besides the nearby river rushing by. Having backed into my spot, I started my car and put it in drive, but had my foot on the brakes. I wanted to see if anything came into sight and then peel out of there if so. Nothing ever showed itself, not that I could see anyways. As I left the area, the dreadful feeling went away, and I had a normal rest of my day, but shaken up a little. I don't know what it was, and don't make any claims. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it was probably a mountain lion, as this occurred near the Box Elder area of Utah, and they're often seen even coming down into the cities. So one still in the mountains, but only a half mile from some fancy houses, probably isn't too strange. Either way, a few things still strike me to this day. Whatever it was, clearly knew it had revealed itself when it stepped on the branch. And was smart enough to recognize, I immediately looked in its general direction as a result. The fact that something saw me. Saw me notice its mistake in that I still saw absolutely nothing in turn during the middle of the day. Still freaks me out. Mountain lions are notorious for their natural camouflage, so this still track. The sense of dread before I even got to the trailhead. I felt this a few times, as you might see in my other post, and slash the truth is here. But even then, I didn't feel the same dread like I did here on this little trail. I knew I was going to be in danger, then ignored that, and then knew there were eyes on me by something I couldn't see myself. Then that instinctual knowledge was confirmed when there was very clearly a large step taken among the trees to my right. I have a handful of stories similar to this that are also 100% real things that have happened to me that I think I'll try to post someday. I keep running into similar situations because I keep going out when I have the sense I should not. Now I want to preface this story by stating that I'm a very analytical person. I'm a technical business analyst, for God's sake, so my livelihood is to analyze and find reasoning behind every situation. But it's to the point where I can't deny that something is living in my family home, and it imitates my mom. I live in Queensland, Australia. In about 2004, we moved into a very old Queenslander home. Google Queenslander home and you'll see the type of house I'm talking about. It was a big fixer-upper with very high ceilings and a beautiful deck that caught the summer breeze perfectly. It was the first house built in the entire street over 150 years ago and used to be a celery farm. Random, I know. About 15 years ago, my cousin was sleeping over one night. We were very close and she told me all about her paranormal experiences. For context, she grew up in Indonesia, and her mother was apparently into black magic, so she is seen, and experienced a lot of the paranormal. Is there anything in my house? I asked her. Yes, she replied. She sits on the windowsill of your mum's room. Is it bad? I asked, not too sure if I wanted to actually hear the answer. Just don't bother it, she said, shutting down the conversation. Fast forward a few years, I was sitting on my bed studying with the door open. I then see my mom walk down the hallway with a washing basket, about to put on a load of laundry. About five seconds later, I see her walk down the hallway with a washing basket, going the same direction she was before. I was baffled. How could she walk the same direction twice? I tried to shake it off, thinking it was just my tired mind playing tricks on me. After all, I was studying and it was late. About a year passes, and I had forgotten the spooky incident of my mom walking in the same direction twice. It was a Friday afternoon, and I had my best friend over, and we were hanging out in the kitchen talking to my mom. 
Mom was cooking dinner, and me and my friend were just chatting away. My brother then appears from his room. Where's dinner? he asks. Still another thirty minutes away, Mom replies. But you just came into my bedroom and told me dinner is ready. We all froze still, silent. Chills ran up the back of my spin as I remember the incident that happened a year prior. No, I didn't, Mom responded. Yes, you did, my brother exclaimed. You knocked, opened my door, walked into my room and told me dinner is ready. I can vouch for my mom that she didn't do this. After all, I was with her the entire time. My brother shook his head. Perhaps I'm imagining things and walked back to his room. I knew he wasn't imagining things. From there, things got weird, but only for me. My brother never had another experience, and neither did my mom. My placid dog, a big, fat, golden lab, would jump up from her sleep and growl and bark at the corner of the room. Doors that I closed would open up behind me, and I always, always felt like something didn't want me there. Fast forward a few years. I had moved out of home and was asked by my mom to dog sit while she went away for the weekend. I did. It was a hot summer night, and I was in the spare bedroom with the air conditioning on freezing cold. Then, at the exact same time, the air conditioning turned off. My phone went to do not disturb, and the bedroom door flung open. I don't mean the door creaked open. I mean flung, as if someone swung it open in anger. I jumped up and ran out of the room, calling my boyfriend freaking out. He calmed me down, and for whatever reason, I stayed at the house as a horror film fanatic. I know this was a dumb move. It became time for bed, so I went to take the dog outside to go potty before bringing her back in. She is a stubborn old thing, so I have to physically go outside and stand in the backyard with her. Otherwise, she will not go. Whilst we were outside and the dog was sniffing around trying to find her toilet spot for that evening, I felt something. I don't know how to describe it, because I didn't actually see anything. But I felt something that looked like my mother, at the end of the backyard, standing and looking directly at me. I know that sounds weird, but the feeling was so strong. People will say it was your mind playing tricks on you, but it wasn't. Because I have never before, nor since, had a feeling like that before. It was like I was seeing something without actually seeing it. I sensed it, and I sensed it strong. She was in a nightgown, blonde, shoulder-length hair, looking just like my mother, except cold and emotionless and engrossed. I rushed the dog back inside and went to bed. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night. Whatever it was imitating my mother, it didn't like me. It never showed itself to my mom or brother, but for some reason loved to torment me. That was until recently. I was over at my mom's for dinner, and the topic of ghost stories came up. I brought up all the experiences I had had at that house, and how I found it so strange that Mom never experienced it. Mom looked at me with a blank stare, almost as if she was trying to hold something in. What is it? I asked. Well, the other week something happened. She began to tell me the story, which finally made her realize I was telling the truth. Except this time, it imitated someone else. Mom was with her friend on the balcony having some afternoon tea. Where's the bathroom? Her friend asked. Just down the hallway. Mom replied. Her friend then got up to go to the bathroom. From the balcony, you can pretty much see everything from the house as it looks straight down the hallway. Mom looked down, eating her afternoon tea, and when she looked back up, she saw her friend walk out of the toilet. And into my mum's bedroom. Friend's name, mum shouted out. What are you doing? No response. Friend's name. Mum shouted a bit more, getting up from her seat to go and see why she went into her room. Just as she was about to walk down the hall, there appeared her friend walking out of the toilet. Nobody was in her bedroom. I don't know what this thing is that imitates people in my mum's house. But I know it's not nice. It's not friendly, and it doesn't want me around. All I can say is I'm glad I moved the f out. Has anyone else experienced anything like this?
I just wanted to share something that happened to me a couple of days ago. Early in the year, my fiancé died unexpectedly when I wasn't home. We had been together for eight years. One time we were discussing something we heard on the atheist experience about messages from beyond the grave where the person discussed something happening to a light bulb that they thought were a friend. Then I said I'd like to have a huge neon sign or something in the sky that was painfully obvious and impossible to mistake if I was going to receive a message from the other side, and we laughed. For the sake of this post, I'm going to call my fiancé John. This has been my first year and the first birthday in over a decade without him, and it's been extremely hard. I was going home in a metro, and on comes this commercial where there's a dude playing a piano, and behind him is a huge neon sign written, We Love John. And it's almost creepy that the people in the ad are pointing at you, talking towards you, and saying thank you, John, a couple more times through this ad. So many little things, like the humongous neon sign at the back and the song played by the piano player, all really make me really feel this is a message. And it was on my birthday, too. This ad has never played again since my birthday, and I'm on YouTube a lot, especially now because I'm bedridden because of Pandemic 19. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.